Hi, I'm Claire Ridgway. I'm the author of The Fall of Anne Boleyn, A Countdown, and various other Tudor history books, and also creator of the Anne Boleyn Files and Tudor Society websites. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about Anne Boleyn, with it being um, the 19th of May, which is the 480th anniversary of her execution in 1536. Now, as it's the 19th of May today, I thought I would actually share with you an extract from my book. Um, my book actually um, counts down um, the whole of Anne's fall day by day. Um, it never fails to have an impact on me. I mean, I write articles every year for the Anne Boleyn Files about the events leading up to Anne's execution. And it never fails to have this massive impact on me just... You know, I get the idea of of, of what shocking events um, they were and how fast it all happened. Um, and of course, it culminated in her awful execution. The execution of Queen Anne Boleyn. At dawn on the 19th of May, 1536, Queen Anne Boleyn celebrated the Mass for the last time receiving the sacrament from her almoner, John Skip. She then ate breakfast and waited to hear Sir William Kingston's footsteps outside her door. At 8am, the constable appeared, informing Anne that the hour of her death was near and that she should get herself ready. But Anne was already prepared. She'd taken special care with her outfit. The ermine trim symbolised royalty, and crimson, the colour of her kirtle, was associated with martyrdom. Her hood was the traditional English gable hood, rather than her usual stylish French hood. Anne left the sumptuous royal palace for the last time, walking past the Great Hall, through Coal Harbour Gate, and along the western side of the White Tower. There, ahead of her, was the newly erected black-draped scaffold. Kingston helped his prisoner up the scaffold steps, and Anne stepped forward to address the crowd. The crowd fell silent as they gazed at their queen, a woman with an untroubled countenance. Anne then delivered her final speech. Good Christian people, I have not come here to preach a sermon. I have come here to die. For according to the law and by the law, I am judged to die and therefore I will speak nothing against it. I am come hither to accuse no man, nor to speak of that whereof I am accused and condemned to die. But I pray God save the king, and send him long to reign over you, for a gentler nor a more merciful prince was there never, and to me he was ever a good, a gentle and sovereign lord. And if any person will meddle of my cause, I require them to judge the best. And thus I take my leave of the world and of you all, and I heartily desire you all to pray for me. Now this speech is corroborated by Edward Hall the Chronicler, George Wyatt, John Fox and Lord Herbert of Cherbury. Unlike her brother, George Boleyn, Lord Rochford, Anne did not protest her innocence and preach to the crowd, she simply did what was expected of her. Executions were carefully choreographed with a set format for execution speeches, which Anne followed to the letter. There was no way that she would risk her daughter's safety by defying the king and proclaiming her innocence. Elizabeth's safety and her future relationship with her father the king were paramount in Anne's mind as she prepared to meet her maker. Anne paid the distressed executioner, who asked Anne's forgiveness. Her ladies then removed Anne's mantle, and Anne lifted off her gable hood. It is said that a young lady presented her with a linen cap with which she covered her hair, and she knelt down, fastening her clothes about her feet, and one of the said ladies bandaged her eyes. The crowd, who would have been well used to executions by this time, were moved by the Queen's plight, many of them crying. As Anne sank to her knees in readiness, the crowd too sank to its knees, following the example of Sir John Allen, the Lord Mayor. It is said that only Charles Brandon, Duke of Suffolk, 
and Henry Fitzroy, Duke of Richmond, remained on their feet. As Anne waited for the executioner to strike, she started praying. O Lord, have mercy on me. To God I commend my soul. To Jesus Christ I commend my soul. Lord Jesu, receive my soul. Historian Eric Ives writes that her only show of fear was the way that she kept looking behind her to check that the executioner was not going to strike the fatal blow too soon. As Anne prayed, the executioner called out to his assistant to pass him his sword. As Anne moved her head to follow what the assistant was doing, the executioner came up unnoticed behind her and beheaded her with one stroke of his sword. It was over. As the shocked crowd dispersed, Anne's ladies, who were described as bereft of their souls, such was their weakness, wrapped her head and body in white cloth and took them to the chapel of St Peter ad Vincula for burial. No casket had been provided, so a yeoman warder fetched an old elm chest which had once contained bow stays from the Tower Armoury. Anne Boleyn, Queen of England and mother of Queen Elizabeth I, was then buried as a traitor in an unmarked grave. The Tower cannons fired to tell London that its Queen was dead. Sir William Kingston was paid £100 by the Crown for Anne Boleyn's jewels and apparel, and that was that. One Queen was dead, and another was about to take her place. Sir Francis Bryan took the news of Anne's death to her replacement, Jane Seymour. Who knows what she thought of the bloody events of the past few days. Scottish theologian Alexander Eliseus, or Alexander Ailes, had woken up in the early hours of the 19th of May from a nightmare about the Queen's severed neck in which he could count the nerves, the veins and the arteries. He went to visit his friend Archbishop Cramner in his garden at Lambeth. Eliseus was unaware of Anne's imminent execution, having remained at home since the day of Anne's imprisonment. But as he told the Archbishop of his dream, Cramner raised his eyes to heaven and said, She who has been the Queen of England upon earth will today become a Queen in heaven. So great was his grief that he could say nothing more, and then he burst into tears. The Archbishop, who owed his rise to the patronage of Queen Anne Boleyn and her family, was a broken man, and perhaps he felt some guilt for his part in recent events. It is hard to imagine how he would have felt on hearing the cannons ring out over London, announcing the Queen's death. Queen Anne Boleyn was gone, gone to a better place. Now, Anne Boleyn was executed at the Tower of London. Um, we now know, Eric Ives did some marvellous work for his biography, The Life and Death of Anne Boleyn. We now know that she wasn't executed in the spot where the um, modern glass memorial uh, stands today, but she was actually executed on the spot of what is actually a parade ground between the White Tower and the present entrance of the Crown Jewels. So on that large parade ground there was an erected a new scaffold particularly for especially for Anne Boleyn. Now her body as I said was taken to the chapel of St Peter ad Vincula which is the chapel royal of the Tower of London. Um, you can go there, uh, yeoman warders tours uh, tend to end there or you can wait until after the yeoman warders tours of the day are over. It's generally about 4.30, 5, and then it is open to the public for you to go in sort of quietly and see um, Anne Boleyn's memorial tile in there. Um, because her memorial tile dates back to 1876, 1877, because at that time um, there was some restoration work going on with the chapel. It was seen to be in a very poor, dilapidated state. And Queen Victoria decided that, you know, this chapel royal really needed restoring. Now, the idea was to leave the chancel area alone because of these important burials. I mean, you've got Queen Anne Boleyn there, um, you've got um, Lady Jane Grey there, you've got dukes and lots of important people there. It was decided to sort of leave you know, them in rest if, it, if they could. 
Unfortunately, the pavement there was sinking. I think some of the coffins sort of underneath had, had, you know, deteriorated and caused the floor to sink. So it was decided that it had to be restored and therefore the remains in that area needed to be exhumed. Now, there is a wonderful book. I, I've got... It's actually a Victorian book that I've got. It's got an inscription in it, actually, dated... 1882. Um, it's called, I'll read out the title to you, Notices of the Historic Persons Buried in the Chapel of St Peter Ad Vincula in the Tower of London, with an account of the discovery of the supposed remains of Queen Anne Boleyn. And it's by um, Doyne C. Bell, who was actually given the job of minuting everything, minuting all the meetings that were going on about the restoration and writing everything down for Queen Victoria. So these reports date back to 1876 and 87 and they're in a book. And what's lovely about the book is it isn't just minutes of meetings and um, and things like that, which might be a bit boring. It actually has got the sort of medical reports on the remains that were found, and also really useful biographies of each person um, that was executed at the Tower of London and who was buried um, in, in the chapel. So it's a wonderful book. If you can't find, I was very lucky to find this antique copy. Um, I think I got it from Abe Books and you can sometimes see copies coming up on eBay. Um, but there are versions on Amazon now, I think, which have just been sort of scanned or transcribed. But here is what happened um, when they were doing the restoration. Um, so it was decided that the pavement should be raised in order to remedy any further sinking. The pavement was then lifted on the spot which was marked on the plan as the place of Queen Amberlynn's interment. So they had a plan which was based on the Tower of London records of the burial, so they kind of knew where to look. The earth removed to a depth of two feet. It had certainly not been disturbed for upwards of a hundred years. At this depth, the bones of a female were found, not lying in the original order, but which had evidently, for some reason or another, been heaped together into a smaller space. All these bones were examined by Dr Muat, and he was the pathologist who um, was being tasked with looking at the remains, who at once pronounced them to be those of a female of between 25 and 30 years of age, of a delicate frame of body, and who had been of slender and perfect proportions. The forehead and lower jaw were small and especially well formed. The vertebrae were particularly small, especially one joint, the atlas, which was that next to the skull, and they bore witness to the queen's little neck. He thought that these female bones had lain in the earth for upwards of 300 years, and they were certainly all those of one person. No other female bones were found on this spot. So they dug in the place where Tower Records had said that Queen Anne Boleyn was buried, and they found the bones of a female all gathered together, and no other bones sort of mixed in or very close to it. So I, I do feel that, you know, it was, there's a high probability that it was Anne Boleyn. They then found some male bones further along, and we know that the Duke of Northumberland and the Duke of Somerset were buried between two queens, as it was described. So between Queen Anne Boleyn and Queen Catherine Howard, and those male bones were thought to be those dukes. So that all fits together. The book also includes um, a very detailed memorandum by Dr Muat on um, the findings about Anne Boleyn. He said, the bones, uh, the bones found in the place where Queen Anne Boleyn is said to have been buried are certainly those of a female in the prime of life, all perfectly consolidated and symmetrical and belong to the same person. The bones of the head indicate a well-formed round skull with an intellectual forehead, straight orbital ridge, large eyes, oval face and rather square full chin. The remains of the vertebrae and the bones of the lower limbs indicate a well-formed woman of middle height with a short and slender neck. The ribs show depth and roundness of chest. The hands and feet bones indicate delicate and well-shaped hands and feet with tapering fingers and a narrow foot. 
They are all consistent with the published descriptions of the Queen, and the bones of the skull might well belong to the person portrayed in the painting by Holbein in the collection of the Earl of Warwick. And then you get a very, very, very detailed report about each bone. And there were bones that were missing. They, you know, they weren't all there, which is why people often say to me, well, surely you know it's Anne Boleyn because they could see, you know, where the sword, you know, damaged the bones. Well, unfortunately, there were some vertebrae missing, so she couldn't have been um, identified um, by that. I've also get people saying, well, oh, yes, I've heard that the Victorians proved that it was Anne Boleyn um, by finding um, an extra finger. But that's not true. And I wonder if the confusion comes from this bit. It says 11 finger bones phalanges. Are people reading that as, oh, well, there were 11, 11 fingers? You know, um, well, that must be an extra one. Well, I'm sorry, but the phalanges, the finger bones, we actually have 14 phalanges on each hand. So there were finger bones missing. Now, obviously, Nicholas Sander in um, the 1580s wrote of Anne having an extra finger, but there are no contemporary um, reports or evidence to back that up at all. And he also said she had protruding teeth and she had a wen. And, you know, he, he didn't give a very flattering impression of her. But George Wyatt, who was the grandson of Thomas Wyatt the Elder, the poet, who obviously Thomas Wyatt knew Anne. Um, George Wyatt, in his biography of Anne Boleyn, talks about um, there being a show of nail on one of her fingers. Now, the Victorians um, thought that they might be able to, you know, find some malformation on a finger bone or something to to sort of, uh, you know, back this up. But um, it says that on a careful examination, it dissipated that impression. So there was nothing on the finger bones. There was nothing wrong with her hands from the bones that they found. Now, what happened to her remains after they'd been examined by Dr. Muat? Well, here are the minutes of a meeting from the 13th of April 1877. A meeting was held in the chapel of St. Peter in the Tower on Friday the 13th of April at 12 o'clock when Colonel Millman produced seven cases which contained the remains that had been exhumed from the chancel on the 9th and 11th of November last. These remains had been soldered up in thick leaden coffers and then fastened down with copper screws in boxes made of oak plank one inch in thickness. Each box bore a leaden escutcheon on which was engraved the name of the person whose supposed remains were thus enclosed, together with the dates of death and of the year 1877 of the reinterment. The cases were then placed in the respective positions in the chancel in which the remains had been found, and the ground having been opened, they were all buried about four inches below the surface. The earth was then filled in and concrete immediately spread over them. The various positions of these interments are recorded upon a plan which we copied on vellum and deposited among the records belonging to the tower. It was then decided as well that tiles would be put down as memorial tiles to show these positions and they're what you can see today. Queen Anne Boleyn has a beautiful one. There are also tiles to the Dukes of Somerset um, and Northumberland, um, Catherine Howard, and they're, they're all in the chancel area, which is actually um, roped off, so you have to stay behind the rope. But today, the 19th of May, flowers will be laid on Queen Anne's memorial, and there's always a basket of red roses with just a card that just simply says Queen Anne Boleyn on it, and that is delivered every year. Now, the yeoman warders uh, don't know who delivers it. There are various theories. Apparently, in the past, um, one of the um, one of the heads, sort of heads of the Tower of London, uh, traced um, the flowers to a florist in a Kent village, and it is thought that um, perhaps it's um, descendants of the Boleyn family that send this every year. That there was money left. Um, in a will for this to happen every year. It's a beautiful tradition and the yeoman warders take it very, very seriously. The flowers come by taxi usually and then they are taken and placed on the memorial tile. But other people leave flowers there as well and flowers also on the glass memorial. 
Now, this book also includes, as well as beautiful Victorian engravings, it also includes a plan of the burials in the chancel area. So it's a fascinating book, but for me, I really do think there's no reason to doubt um, the Victorian sort of records and their findings and to say that, you know, Anne Boleyn isn't there or she's in another position. They dug where they were told that Anne Boleyn was, according to the Tower Records, they found a skeleton which seems to sort of uh, match in that it's a female, it was sort of of the right age, um, and it had the two men beside it. So it's very, very interesting, and I would recommend sort of getting hold of a copy of this if you can. Anyway, um, I hope that this has been a fitting tribute to Queen Anne Boleyn, who was executed on this day in 1536.